Determining the proper neck tension for your reloads is something that there are a lot of opinions on, and we've already done some research here on the channel. But what about new brass? If you've ever opened a box of new brass, you've seen this sight before. Bent case necks. We know we have to straighten them out, but how exactly is the best way, and is it possible to achieve consistent neck tension across the lot on new brass, or do we have to wait for it to be fireformed first? I've heard many people that I hold in high regard to recommend not starting low development until you have at least once fired brass. What if the biggest problem we have with new brass is not having consistent neck tension from case to case? Today we're going to be analyzing seven different methods for setting our neck tension and see which one yields the most consistent results. If you're anything like me, you've watched tons of videos on how to prepare for that very first firing. But if we're being honest, there's rarely any data given for us to decide which is really the best option. The advice I've settled on was taking a little dry neck lube and running it through an expander mandrel that's two thousandths under the neck diameter and chamfering to bring the case and considering the brass ready to go. In most things with reloading, the general belief is consistency is everything. But as I have said before, when you talk about setting neck tension, it seems that it's very difficult to measure, or at least to describe. Today we're going to be charting out our seating force using our new amp press and really see which method gives us the most consistent results. I'm sure there's some new guys out there that think, how is it possible there's seven different ways to do this? Truly, there's probably more, but I figured this was enough for today's video, and I wanted to hear your thoughts in the comment section below to see if there's a different method that you use that I should be trying as well. So quickly, let's talk about the seven different methods in no particular order. For today's video, we're going to be using brand new Lapua 6.5 Creedmoor Large Rifle Primer Brass and preparing it in the following ways. Option one annealing the brass and then using a 262 expander to open the neck up. For this option, I've always wondered if annealing before the first firing ever made sense. It's clear by just looking at the brass that it was annealed at the factory, but was it the last step done or does it even change anything? So I sacrificed one of our brand new pieces of brass to our amp annealer and got the code 0161. We used our dry neck lube and the 262 expander mandrel and option one is ready to go. Option two is my standard process for new brass that I'm currently using. Simply just running dry neck lube and a 262 mandrel, chamfering to burring, and off to the races. Option three is the same as option two, but a slightly different size expander. For this size, we're going to be using the .2615 mandrel and see if that mandrel is enough to iron out any of the wrinkles and still give us reasonably consistent neck tension. Option four, a full length sizer die. For this option, we'll be simply using my Forrester full length sizing die as it is shipped from the factory, standard expander ball that comes with it, and everything. I've done some measurements on the brass as it comes out of the die, and without the expander ball, you can see that the neck is sized down to about 285 thousandths, and when that .262 inch diameter ball comes back through, it's going to neck it back out to somewhere in the ballpark of 289 or 290 thousandths, depending on the thickness of your brass. If you're using a different manufacturer of die, this will likely be somewhat different. Please keep in mind when we set up this die to process this step, we aren't bumping the case body at all. We're simply resizing the neck. If the brass already fits in our chamber, we don't want to change a headspace measurement at all. For option five, it's going to be very similar to two and three, just using a different expander mandrel. Again, dry neck lube and an expander mandrel sized at 263 thousandths. Option six. For this option, we'll be using a bushing die and simply running the necks through the neck bushing. For today's test, I'm using the Short Action Customs bushing and 287 thousandths. Nothing else will be done to the case necks. This would probably not be a good option if you have significant case neck damage, or you're at least going to want to do something to open those necks back up. But it's an item we're going to test. Option 7, we'll be using that same 287 Short Actions Custom bushing through our neck die, but we're going to add an additional step and running an expander mandrel through it at 262 thousandths to see what happens. Please keep in mind for all these options that if we use just an expander mandrel, we're only using dry neck lube to do the sizing. For any steps like the full length die or any of the bushing dies, we used imperial sizing wax to do the sizing. The lube was wiped off after the sizing had taken place and then placed in an ultrasonic cleaner to remove any of the remaining case lube. Now that we've went over all the different options, let's start looking at some of these charts to see what we can learn. As we look at these graphs, please keep in mind we're graphing the force over the distance traveled during the seating process. As we look at our anneal brass with the 262 mandrel, the initial seating force happened with most of our units somewhere around 40 pounds, and we can see how the neck tension varied between these 11 different samples as the seating process was completed. 
Since this is our first graph, it's hard to judge, but overall, I don't think it's too bad. All 11 pieces seem to be relatively similar. And as far as we know, consistency is really what we're looking for. So our second option, not annealing, just going straight to that 262 mandrel. One thing we can see over on annealed brass was the initial force to start the seating process was a little bit higher in our non-annealed brass. And one thing we'll need to point out in several of our charts that as the settings were when we used the press, the maximum seating force that it was using maxed out somewhere around 170 pounds. Any of the charts you see where they stop short of that full length, the seating process had stopped. But you have most of the graphs on there and you can see that the max seating process would have exceeded 170 pounds, but that will become more apparent in our next graph. For option three, our only slightly smaller mandrel certainly appears that it didn't straighten out all the necks. The neck tension varied much more from the rest of the units. The primary thing I would take out of this graph is that it just didn't clean up all the inconsistencies between the different pieces. Another thing that's much more apparent is that the total seating force would have been higher on a lot of these units as we can see many of them did not complete the seating process when it hit that 170 pound maximum. I believe the press can seat at a higher force than that but that's the settings I was using and I didn't change it between all of the tests. Option number four, our Forrester full length sizing die. While it's clear our initial seating force to seat our projectile was a little bit higher than our other methods, I thought this graph was very interesting and appeared to be the most consistent one so far. One of the most interesting things about this graph to me is the maximum force applied barely got over 120 pounds. Compared to our other samples so far, this is a significant difference. So what happens when we decrease our neck tension a little bit more? Or so we think. For option five, we're looking at this 263 thousandths mandrel, and we can see that our initial force to start seating has been reduced fairly significantly, most samples being under 40 pounds to start the seating process. We can see as the seating process is completed, the forces are not as consistent between our 11 different samples. Still pretty good, but even using our 263 thousandths mandrel, we can see that that force increased pretty significantly, and some of our samples hit that 170 pound maximum. For option six, we're strictly using that Short Action Customs 287 bushing to try and iron these necks out, and some more interesting information. We can see again somewhere around 40 pounds to start that seating process, but there really is a lot of variation between the lowest and highest force used. Overall, without doing anything else, the maximum seating force barely exceeds 130 pounds only on one unit. So I really don't know what to think. Is it possible that some of our lube was still left in these cases? Remember, I wiped these down as well as ultrasonically cleaned them after the process was completed. Now, on to option seven. Using that same Short Action Customs 287 bushings, we chased those with a 262 mandrel. Very interesting to me that it certainly appeared that adding the 262 mandrel to this step increased the amount of force it take to start our projectile at least a little bit for this process. But we can see by adding the mandrel, it really decreased the variation from case to case. It doesn't look quite as consistent as our full length graph, but certainly much improved over just the bushing only. But wait, there's more yet. Another thing that I thought would be interesting is to compare the seating force graphs to one another. So for this particular graph, I averaged all 11 rounds to get the average seating value for that distance move and put them all in the same chart. So depending on the variation, this graph, you should get a little bit of idea how this average seating force from each method compares to one another. Our next graph here, I think is the most telling as what I'm charting here is the standard deviation of the entire 11 samples as the seeding process is occurring. So we can tell which process is yielding the most consistent results. Assuming our loader's adage that consistency is always what we're looking for, this graph to me says everything. Our Forrester full length sizing die by far had the best standard deviation overall. Keeping in mind the beginning of the graph is where the initial seeding process is starting to occur, we can see throughout the rest of the seeding process, the standard deviation in the difference in force values is less than five for our Forrester full length sizing die. Not much behind it is the Short Action Customs 287 bushing with the 262 mandrel. You guys can look at this chart and see what you think for yourselves. I think it's very telling that our standard full length sizing die gave us the lowest amount of variation. I think a fair comment is, well, this is new brass. What about fired brass? Does it even matter for fired? and we're going to get there eventually. But I thought I would throw at least one chart on the screen. So if you would like to see what my standard process yields, this is a Forrester full length sizing die with the expander ball removed. And then going back through with a 262 expander mandrel to open the necks up before we seat the projectile. While this was not an option that we tested with our brand new brass, 
it does yield a result extremely close to the Forrester full length sizing die standard process. But I'm sure you can pause and rewind the video as much as you want to look at all those to your heart's content. I'm very interested to know what your thoughts are in the comment section below on how you're preparing new brass and if these results might make you rethink the way you're doing it. Ultimately, the results on target are what matters the most. So if you want to see those results, make sure you subscribe to the channel to catch the groups and velocities that I achieve when I fire these rounds. If you want to understand better how neck tension can affect the results of your reloads, make sure you check out this playlist here. I hope to see you come back next week. And until then, stay safe and small groups.